This Week in Startups is brought to you by Envision. Get Envision for startups with unlimited users on the full suite of Envision tools, plus enterprise-level security and support at envision.com slash twist. That's I-N-V-I-S-I-O-N dot com slash twist. Equity Zen, the premier marketplace allowing private investors to access proven startups. Head to equitysend.com slash twist now to get started for free and get your minimum first investment cut in half. Silicon Valley Bank, purpose-built for founders and high-growth startups, Silicon Valley Bank offers banking and financial solutions that fit every stage of the startup journey. Visit svb.com forward slash next to learn more. Silicon Valley Bank, ideas bank here. And now, part two of Jason and Jerry Colonna's intimate and revealing conversation. Enjoy. How is it that a guy grows up with a belief system that life is war? Yeah. How has that impacted the way in which you launch businesses? Yeah. The way in which you have attempted to lead? Yeah. In what way has that served you? Yeah. Well, and in what way has it gotten in your way? Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you very specifically. Oh. You remember the Silicon Valley Reporter days? I do. I had two, uh, two uh, competitors. You might remember their names. Uh, uh, there was a pr- newsletter and a weekly email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One was, was run by two ladies. One right. was run by Jason Trevokas and Tom Watson. Right. At New York, Alley At Cat. New York, right. And, and Alley Cat. Cat. And then there was the New York New Media Association. Right. The New York New Media Association invited me, Stephen Berlin Johnson- and one other person to come to the New York New Media Association meeting. After that meeting, they put Stephanie Simon from Feed and one other person on the board of the New York Media Association. So of the three people they invited to the guy who started NINMA, he was some analyst guy, I forgot his name. It's Mark Stallman. Mark Stallman. We're at Mark Stallman's loft and there I was in the center of power with the newsletter with 16 pages Maybe we're on episode, we were in issue three or four. And they invited me there, and I didn't realize it was an interview to get some young blood on that board. Mm. They turned me down. Mm. But they put the other two people up. Mm. And then the At New York guys were 10 years ahead of me, and they were great journalists. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't write at the time. I couldn't spell. I didn't know where the comma went. (laughs) There, there, there. I didn't know. And I said to myself, I have to destroy Ninma, at New York, and Alley Cat. Mm. And I will work every hour of every day until I do. Mm. But I was not happy necessarily. I was having the time of my life in one way because there was an adrenaline rush. But I remember telling the story to somebody. I sat there with my lieutenants and I said, we have to destroy at New York. Give me your best ideas. Mm. I mean, it's like some Axe Capital Billions level Mm -hmm. deviance when you look at it. It's unnecessary to destroy everybody around you to win, but that is how I looked at the world. And I said, they're a weekly email and they are scooping us. They would find out who was gonna be on the cover of the magazine because that person would tell them. Mm. And then they would write a feature story about them the week before the magazine came out. Mm. So I sat there and I said, I am gonna start Silicon Alley daily. Mm. And I'll do a daily email newsletter. And they said, who's going to do all this? I said, you guys are going to do it. And they said, well, we're doing the magazine. I said, do both. And they said, well, but we don't, we're already working 60 hours a week. I said, work 70. Mm. We're not going to let them beat us. And I was the asshole's asshole. I was the jerk of a boss you could never imagine. People hated working for me. But some of these people turned into some of the great writers. But looking back on it, I didn't need to be that way. And then I looked at Nidman and said, they had cyber sites? Great. I'm doing Silicon Alley. 2000, Silicon Alley 1999. I'm going to build the biggest conference ever and none of those motherfuckers are ever speaking. Mm. And I held it, held to that. I wouldn't let Stallman, I wouldn't give him a free ticket, none of them. Mm. They were dead to me. Stephanie Simon, Feed Mm. Magazine, fuck those guys. Mm. I put them down in like the 90s in the Silicon Alley 100, Mm. right? That was the way I looked at the world. It was a war. But it didn't make me necessarily happy. It made me effective. But it doesn't make you happy in that moment. Mm-hmm. So would you have done things differently? No. I think so. it was part of my path was to look at the world. At that point, I consider it my Ronin period because mm-hmm. I didn't have anybody telling me that there was another way. 
I was just a samurai without a master. You know, I had some mentors here or there, yourself When included. did you stop being a samurai? Well. Or have you? Exactly. I think, well, you know, if you look at the Jedi versus the samurai, mm -hmm. you know, they they were modeled after each other, right? Lucas' mm -hmm. influence was Kurosawa. And so I look back over those decades and I just think to myself, like, I was an out of control samurai. Amen, brother. A drinking samurai, a drunk samurai in a way. Mm -hmm. And one of the... One of the Kurosawa films is Yojimbo, and uh, it's just a samurai who drinks too much and cuts people's arms off and just does not give an F. Hmm. And I think I was that guy. What did it cost you? I think the people who worked for me at that time did not have a good experience, and I think it made me unhappy to treat people in the way I treated people. I regret how I treated people who are now perversely thankful to me for being the maniac I was. Mm. But I look back on it and say, well, that's just Stockholm Syndrome. Mm. You shouldn't actually laud that behavior. Just like the people at mm -hmm. Apple who defend Steve Jobs for berating people and destroying people, just because they made the best products in the world and just because he was a visionary, I actually don't think later in life now at this age that he was proud of that. And you could see in the end of his life, he was actually trying to be a better person. Bill Gates, same thing, right? Like he was known for chewing people out. I don't think that that life is sustainable. I don't think it makes you happy over time. What was the cost? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I just didn't do my best work. You know, looking back on it, I feel like I'm doing my best work now because now the people who work for me, I look at them and say, this is a place for people who get shit done, work incredibly hard, and don't need supervision. It's for adults. So can I respond as if I were a coach? Please. <clears throat> I would like you to love the samurai that exists within you. Yeah. That samurai kept you safe. For sure. That samurai made sure you were never going back to Brooklyn. That samurai made sure that were you to go back home, you would go back a conqueror. For sure. And in a sense, that samurai made sure that your dad was safe. Yeah. And so we honor that samurai. Yeah. We say thank you. And there's a ceremony that I'd like you to do in your mind. Yeah. Which is when that samurai takes his sword off and puts it on the rack on the wall yeah. and bows to it and says, thank you. But the truth is you're safe. Yeah. And you don't need to take anybody's arms off or to take anybody out anymore. No. You get to do the work that you were meant to do with joy. Because guess what? You're an incredibly brilliant, creative, thoughtful, person. And the truth is, when you walked into my office, when you were 23 years old, I saw it immediately. Because I saw through all of the bluster yeah. and all of the samurai-ness. You know why I saw through that? Now that you've read my book? Yeah. Because I was seeing me. Yeah. 100%. I know you. Yeah. And I will know you till the day you die. Same. And I will love you anyway. <laughs> it's the same, Jerry. And you don't need to do that anymore. But I'm going to give you one more piece. Okay. If anybody fucks with your people, you take that sword off the wall <laughs> and you defend with your last ounce of breath. Yeah. When I was a boy, it was Hulk. Yeah. That was my image. Really? Bruce it was the is. Hulk. Yeah. And what I have come to do is turn the Hulk into Thor. Oh. See, Hulk and Thor are just as strong. For sure. Yeah. But Thor fights with justice. Right. Thor doesn't get out of control. No, he's considered. He's considered. He's also got a sense of humor about it. And he does. He's self-aware. And you do not fuck with Asgard. No. No, there's a lot of warriors there. Yeah. They, you do not go there. Yeah, they have some of the great weapons. That's right. Yeah, they have it in their arsenal. That's right. It is interesting. Like if you can, I think one of the things about growing up which is, I, I, when I saw the title, I was like, wow, I think it's just such a great title because it's not what you'd expect in a business book. Everything's so tactical. Um, you know, we had a, we had Randy Comisar on, 
who also good man. good man and Hollis did his book and I think it was straight talk was it straight talk for startups his Jackie yeah and it was like very tactical it's like a hundred tactical things like this is fantastic and I think your book's a good bookend to it because if you can reconcile the narrative of your life, mm-hmm. which takes, you know, I think meditation helped me get there as well. Mm-hmm. The long distance running is the ultimate meditation. Like mm-hmm. doing 11 marathons will get you there, trust me. There's mm-hmm. nothing like facing the 21st mile that will make you self aware. When you're in the Bronx mm-hmm. and you don't think you're making it to Manhattan, back to the metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Like there it is, right? right. The marathon. Across another river. <laughs> the marathon is actually when Fred LeBeau made that course. He must have understood it because you go from Staten Island, it's the worst possible place you could <laughs> grow up in the five boroughs. Only because we're from Brooklyn. Can exactly. We <laughs> but I mean, that's the armpit of the five boroughs. No offense to Staten Island. There's a reason they put the world's largest landfill. No, sorry, exactly. sorry, it's friends true. Staten Sorry, Staten Island. Staten Island. But they anyways, shut the landfill. They shut the landfill. Basically, the, they, the first tenth of a mile is in Staten Island and none of the rest. Right. You're literally in Staten Island for one block. You right. get on the Verrazano. Right. You go to Brooklyn. You're in Brooklyn for a good right. 10 miles. They give you a little taste of Manhattan. Right. Then they send you the fuck out of there and say, go to Queens. Right. And then you go to Queens. You get back into Manhattan for a little bit. You're like, you know what? You made it to Manhattan, kid. Go to the Bronx. Right. You go to the Bronx. <laughs> and literally, I remember it was like yesterday, I'm <laughs> coming into the Bronx, and there was nobody there. Right. Up second Avenue. Everybody's cheering you. Right. Everybody in Manhattan's having drinks. It's great. Right. You go to the Bronx. There was a guy cracked out of his skull with a pack of Marlboros <laughs> holding it out, <laughs> saying, smoke, you need to smoke. And I'm running by. I'm like, dude, we're running the marathon. I thought about it for a second. <laughs> and you just run this two or three miles, which is hilariously. Sorry, I got a little makeup in my um, I'm not crying. I have makeup in my uh, It is hilarious. And then you get into Manhattan and you're in Central Park and it's glorious. You know you're going to make it. You know Envision as the product design platform used by thousands of startups and by 100% of the Fortune 100. Well, now they have a new offering with startups in mind, and it's called, wait for it, Envision for Startups. And this will help you streamline your workflow from design all the way to development, and it will make your startup life so much more manageable. Envision for Startups gives you the full suite of Envision tools, all packaged with startups in mind. You're gonna get unlimited accounts for your entire team to collaborate so everybody has a voice, as well as enterprise security and customer support. You can get Envision for Startups at envision.com slash twist. That's I-N-V-I-S-I-O-N dot com slash twist. Streamline your workflow with unlimited users and get the full suite of Envision tools, including the very cool freehand collaboration tool, which is just amazing. And it's just one of their many tools. You'll see it uh, when you go to the site. and you will get that enterprise level security and support. Thanks again to Envision for supporting This Week in Startups. Talk to me about the founder of Etsy and losing the CEO spot. I thought how you handled it. He wasn't the founder, he was CEO. CEO rather, SAG, yeah. And he had his time, Mm. but I thought how you handled it with him Mm. was just brilliant. Mm. Walk me through, you know, being the guide on the side for a CEO who's been fired? Mm. Well, unfortunately, it happens a lot. <laughs> um, well, I, I tell the story in the book of the night before he was publicly, uh, or he publicly announced that uh, the board had asked him to step down. And um, it's a very poignant moment because um, for me, it was... Um, a moment in which Chad um, Chad Dickerson really has to confront probably the, the the hardest question that a CEO asks of themselves all the time, which is, "Am I doing a good job?" Huh. How and, do you know? Yeah. How do well, you know? it's really hard, and um, you know the 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 message of that scene. Uh, I use that scene to open the chapter of what I call this notion of a warrior, of being a warrior, which is an open heart and a strong back. Mm. See, I think when you were in your 20s, you understood the strong back of a warrior. Yeah, I had the armor. You had the armor. You yeah. knew how to do it. 
I saw it too. And I think as you have grown up, my friend, yeah. and you know, I get to say that because I've known you for so long, you're now a good man. Huh. Well, okay. Yeah. You are an adult. Yeah, for sure. Um, as you've grown up, you've come to understand that it's okay to have a soft front. For sure. It's strength. It's a strength. Of course. And so in that moment, I talk about him really, really emerging even more strongly as a CEO, huh. simply by the dignity with which he approached the, question, the, the, the challenge of actually telling the staff, telling the world that he was stepping down. There was no sugarcutting. I there was no, fired. like, I'm leaving to spend more time with my family. Yeah. There was no, like, you know, well, I'm sick and burned out. Yeah. It was- They don't want me. It was, <clears throat> and, and to his credit, um, Fred Wilson stood up in front of the team and said, I fired him. And so if you want to be angry, blame me. Mm. That's one of the things I'm proudest of, of my friend Fred. Fred. Yeah. I may have disagreed with how things unfolded, but I, I, to this day, am proud of both of my friends, Fred and Chad, who, by the way, are really good friends now. Really? Yeah. Huh. Because this is the thing. Fred did what a hard thing that he knew he had to do, yeah. and Chad did a hard thing that he knew he had to do. Yeah. And that doing hard things doesn't mean that we're doing something wrong. Just because it's painful mm. doesn't mean it's wrong. No, that's a warrior. That's the crucible, as Warren Bennis. That's the crucible. You bring Warren Bennis up. I had him on the podcast. I remember. Yeah, and it's that was like a wow. That guy was unique. Right. And but he, that. But that. This is an example of Bennis's yeah of crucible. the crucible. This is it. Like, you know, it's the. It just came to me. You said before. Uh, what do you think you lost? And I realize what it is now. What? People were scared of me. Yeah. I don't want people to be scared of me. Why not? Because I didn't get to be friends with them. I didn't get to enjoy that time with them. So remember the three things that I speak of yeah. in the book that we want. Yeah. We want to be loved yeah. and to love. I wasn't loved. We want to feel safe and we want to feel that we belong. Yeah. So your warrior made you safe. Right. What your adult is helping you to become, because it's always a practice, because I guarantee you that there are times in that you slip, Yeah, is to feel loved. Yeah. Is to love and be loved, and then therefore to feel like we belong. Yeah. Because what did we want as children when we were in Brooklyn? We really wanted to belong. Yeah, be safe, be loved, not get beat up on the way to school. When Ninmus didn't turn to you- oh, that burned me. I didn't belong. That burned me. You know, Jason, I've watched you for a long time. And for me, when when you move from New York to LA and from LA to San Francisco, what is it what have you been looking for yeah. other than the place to belong? Yeah. Now, the truth is I think you belong here in San Francisco. I enjoy it. Do you belong here? I feel like I belong. In a way, in the same way you found your calling, I think, to yeah. open your heart and be there with them. I think I feel in a way a little bit like Obi-Wan to your Yoda. Mm -hmm. Like Yoda's kind of in the temple. He's, you know, he's out in mm -hmm. Colorado. He's or a whatever. holograph. <laughs> well, I mean, he's like on Dagobah, right? And like people come to him as your kind of existence, right? Like there's a lot more wisdom, I, like that I think. Analogy. And I think I'm still like an Obi-Wan kind of, I could still go fight. They still send me on missions, but I'm kind of here to take those new Padawan, those new Jedi and say, okay, we're going to go into the fight now. Remain That's calm. Right. That's right. Okay. And, and release your anger. Right. Stay calm. That's and right. And read the situation. That's right. And now I have to tell you, it's one of the great joys. When you talk about the Buddhism that you pursued, I never have. I never read a book on Buddhism. I know nothing about it. But it still resonated with me that one of the great joys mm -hmm. is in watching other people mm -hmm. Succeed and having some part of having been there with them for it. Yeah. And, you know, one of the great moments I think in my recent career, everybody focuses on Uber because it's such an outlier. Right. And everybody wishes they had been in that deal. And I, three of the 21 people I introduced it to did go into that deal, me, Cyan, and first round. The other 19 didn't. And Mark's sister brings it up. He was in the room mm. when I brought Travis to pitch it at Open Angel for him. And he, he didn't do it. And he still says it to this day. But calm.com 
has become for me um, so much more mm. than the Uber investment. Mm. Because I feel like Uber was, Travis, talk about a warrior. I mean, there's a samurai who even, you know, like I could fight with him like as part of the seven samurai, but he would be the Tashira Mufune of that pack. He would mm. be leading it. Mm. Um, and he would be the samurai you did not want to get in front of. Like mm. you might pick the fight with me before him. Um, but with Calm, nobody would invest in that company. Mm. And I saw it clearly. Mm -hmm. And people look at what we do as investors, what you did as an investor, what I do as an investor now, what Fred's still doing as an investor, and they just think about it on a financial basis. I don't see that. What I see is looking into somebody's eyes, mm -hmm. hearing why they're doing it, and saying, I agree. It deserves that. This is a noble mission. This deserves to exist in the world. And I would like to come on that mission with you and help to the extent I can. Mm -hmm. But it's your mission. Mm -hmm. But I can be here on the side or in the background helping you. And it was this incredible moment where Alex from Calm, I told him, I was like, well, listen, I, you know, you guys would have been successful one way or the other, but, you know, we're talking about, you know, was there times you thought it would be harder than it was or that you, it might not have worked? And he goes, actually, I don't think it would be here if it wasn't for you. Mm. And I, that was just like, you want to talk about like a moment. And this is on stage in front of a thousand people. And I said, well, I, that's nice of you to say. But he goes, no, no, we talk about it internally all the time. That $378,000 came at a time when nobody believed in us and all we had were no's. And those weren't just no's. They were no's, period. Like, like nobody- Don't come back to me. Don't come back with your meditation app nonsense. And that to me is like the ultimate Jedi moment because you look at somebody and you're like, the metachlorians are off the charts in this individual. Nobody thinks that they're going to be a Jedi. But it's so obvious to me they're going to be a Jedi. All they have to do is the training. All they have to do is put the robe on and, mm. and just be present. And they did it. It's a billion dollar company. Shall I tell you what I see in that story? Sure, please. And I love the analogy of you being Obi-Wan to me, to my Yoda. Because <laughs> <clears throat> um, there are Yodas in my life, just as there were Yodas for Yoda. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Okay. And so here is your noble mission. Yeah. Keep paying it forward. Keep paying it forward. Yeah. I saw something in you. Yeah. You saw something in Alex. Yeah. Keep paying it forward. Yeah. The real gift of being an angel investor, to my mind, sure, the returns are great. It's a lot of fun. It's creative. It's co-generative. But the real gift is to pay it forward, is to create an opportunity for other people to realize and actualize their dreams so that they can close the wounds in their heart, so that they can create the world or go that much closer to the world that they want to be in. Mm. Yeah. Long after I am empty of this meat bag, yeah. you and I will be remembered not for the investments we made, for, but what you did for Alex. Yeah. You know, you want to go back to the question of why I wrote this book? A few weeks after the galley started coming out, I had a launch team meeting, the whole marketing team. And one of the um, members of that team came in and said that a 21-year-old intern working for one of the firms as part of the team came in and had read the, the book and she said it gave her permission to be herself. Huh. That's what I wrote the book for. Yeah. Someday I hope that somebody comes upon a you know, I look at your book and I see page turn after page oh, turn. Oh, no, I, got, I, I had like so many I wanted to but, ask you about. But I love that. Yeah. Because what I want is for people to have a marked up, torn up, engaged with copy. Yeah. Where they hand it to somebody who's struggling and saying, see, read this. Yeah. I love the OFNR. Mm -hmm. I circle that. Mm -hmm. Unpack it. Observation. Feeling, um, feeling, need, request. Such a great, I mean, I know it's not yours, but you, you picked this up somewhere along the way. A way of dealing with um, nonviolent communication. Right? Yeah, yeah. 
Have you ever wondered how to get on the cap table and buy and sell shares in private companies? I'm sure you have. Well, there's an easy place to do that right now. It's called Equity Zen. Equity, E Q U I T Y Zen, Z E N. And Equity Zen is a premier online marketplace where you can invest in private tech companies backed by top tier venture capital firms and angel investors like me, okay? And you can do it long before they IPO. Equity Zen is also for shareholders who want to get a little liquidity. Maybe you've been working at a company like Robinhood or previously Lyft and Uber, and you want to just get a little liquidity before those companies go public, Facebook, et cetera. Well, you can sell some of your shares on Equity Zen and get cash and help out the private investors who are trying to get shares in these coveted, world-changing companies. Some examples of companies that are available right now on Equity Zen before they IPO'd include Spotify, Sonos, Glassdoor, MongoDB, Cloudera, and PillPack. All of these companies did exceptionally well. I was able to use this a couple times in my career. I sold a little bit of my Calm in a secondary. I sold a little bit of my Uber in a secondary. It's a great idea if you're an angel investor or a shareholder in these companies, maybe to sell 10%, 20% of your position as they grow. So, you know, listen, you can dollar cost average, and it's great for private uh, investors who want exposure to this area to buy a little bit of those shares. Go to equityzen.com slash twist. And for twist fans only, Equity Zen is offering offering half the minimum investment. That's right. You can now invest just 10K as opposed to the previous minimum of 20K, but only if you go to this URL, equityzen.com slash twist. So you can dip your toe, you can get your feet wet, you can get your beak wet just for a taste. This is for uh, people who obviously are investors, you know, there's risk involved, but hey, no risk, no reward. That's the story of my life. Thanks again to Equity Zen for supporting my podcast and for lowering the minimum so people can get a taste. EquityZen.com slash twist. EquityZen.com slash twist. Let's get back to this amazing episode of Twist. People are terrible at communication. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Like the people can build these huge companies and not be able to have a conversation with people? Because they can't answer simple questions like, how am I feeling? How are you really feeling, Jerry? How are you really feeling? None of this bullshit. No, I mean, I'm crushing it, Jerry. Yeah, right. Didn't you see the cover of my book? Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I made the cover of the book that obnoxious just to have that point. What What was obnoxious about the cover Well, I just Angel? was like, everybody wants to know how to get rich. Right. And so I just made the subtitle, you know, how somebody turned $100,000 into $100 million because I just thought that would be the greatest hook to get people into the book. You and smuggled to in consciousness. Exactly. That's, that's not so bad. I mean, that's, no, what, I, that's, that's what my, my uh, uh, partner Khaled likes to say that we do at the company all the time is they call us looking for practical skills advice and we smuggle in consciousness. Mm. Well, that's okay. They come in and they, they want you to just they, give them the prescription. They, How they, do they I fix- They want the five things that I need to know as a CEO. Seven things yeah, that Yeah, if I do suck. these things, then I yeah. will be- Loved Oof. and safe, and I will belong for the rest of my life. Right. And I frustrate the shit out of them <laughs> because they ask me those questions, and I say, "Do me a favor, answer my questions first. Yeah. And then they walk away with answers to their own questions. There was that moment in the book where you talked about you were at a Buddhist class mm. with Pema Chodron. Yeah, and they, she, you said that's not fair. <laughs> Pema was teaching on the nature of impermanence, yeah. which is that all things fall apart all the time. Including? Including the concept of impermanence and your understanding of impermanence. And when she said that, I blurted out, that's not fair. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, Catholic, right? Yeah. Another yeah. thing we share. <laughs> yeah. It is interesting, the Catholic guilt that yeah. we will never, I mean, Jesus was tortured to death in the most horrific way possible. Because you have sins. Because of your sins, Mr. Because Colonna. Of your sins, you which sin. by the way, you were born with. You you are born evil, you were born and impure. unless you do the right things. Unless you confess now. Now, then what you will die. What a horrible religion. <laughs> <laughs> I just talked to my friends who were Jewish, I was like, you guys got the, it was so much better, the first, book, the sequel, <laughs> New Testament, bummer. First book, Old Testament, I, great. You know, to, to be fair, I think that this is the human reinterpretation of the teachings. I think that um, uh, 
there's a human tendency to rationalize and explain away the belief system that we are broken and unworthy. Mm -hmm. And we come up with all sorts of philosophies and rationales, guilt induction mm -hmm. to create that. The thing that, that is most moving to me about Buddhism, A, first of all, as far as I'm concerned, I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about enlightenment. I don't give a fuck about it. Yeah. I care about whether or not I'm in pain right now. And those people that I love, whether they're in pain. But the thing that really moved me was the notion that you were born basically good. That, and that's unshakable. That even the most evil person in the world is still fundamentally good. Mm. That doesn't mean that they should be allowed to run free and hurt people. Yeah, they no, can be misguided and turn to the dark side. But, but the truth is, you are human. And just that notion feels radical to me. Yeah. I am basically good simply by being human? Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Goes no, against it's everything. Like, I think it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. It's like do the sacraments of the, uh, what, what was the thing where you walk around the church and they have the stations of the cross? The, it was the stations of the, the cross. Stations you do of that. the cross. Where it's like, you, where you, here's you where are, Jesus is. Right, reliving the crucifixion of Christ. Which, by the way, the crucifixion of Christ basically means the torture to death of Christ with <laughs> nails and hammers, a spear, and a crown of thorns. Oh, you want to go in a little deeper on it? In a loincloth. To go through all of that and yet have done nothing wrong. Right. Because he's guilt-free. He's guilt-free. It wasn't his fault. He didn't do anything. He's doing it on behalf of other people. Right. Talk about a mind fuck. <laughs> and then they made us study the every step along the way. Yeah. The shroud. He's and the wiped blood, the blood. And Veronica. Remember Veronica? She's the one who wiped it. Wiped his face yeah. with a cloth. And, yeah, and yeah. that cloth exists somewhere in Italy or something. Well, no. I think you're thinking of maybe Oh, maybe does. the Da Vinci Code. You, no, you're thinking of those, <laughs> the, the Shroud of Turin, his his burial shroud. Ah. Right? But I thought also they said that the- Veronica's- uh, well, yeah, maybe. like her rag. Yeah, right. That she wiped the blood off his face. Right. Also, it may, like right. a piece of it may exist- Right. Theoretically, in a church, some way, right? right. But, oh my! Lord. We could, we could do a whole another episode on Jackie, the bizarre. Relics. Jackie's church was Our Lady of Sorrows. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to kindergarten. <laughs> Welcome to school. How about this one? How about the imagery of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is this heart with a crown of thorns on it? Yes. You're what? <laughs> yeah, basically the thing that's keeping us all alive, wrapped in barbed wire. <laughs> right, right. Nothing sadistic and insane no, about that. No, 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 no. You know, it's one thing I wanted to ask you. It's not in the book, but I I'm assuming you watched The Sopranos. Yeah. When it was on. You got and a problem with that? I don't got a problem with that. <laughs> you want to step out? <laughs> you remember Tony Soprano's mom? Yeah. This parallel, obviously, you're yeah. Italian. His mom was crazy uh, or went crazy. I think all Italian mothers. No, just kidding. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> uh, it, there's definitely something there. Um, I'll leave it at that. But his mom is basically suffering from dementia or whatever. Right. And she says to one of his kids, the son, and I think it like hits him really hard. And he's, I, I may be butchering it, but she says something to the face of, it's all a giant nothing. Ah. Like life is meaningless. Mm. And she basically, Tony has suffered mm. through his mother. Mm. His mother takes his child mm. and then destroys his life mm. at the age of 10 or 12 as like, you know, she's held up on the pedestal. Right. She tells him, listen, life is meaningless. It's a big giant nothing. Mm. Forget about it. It's nothing's important. Mm. It's a I giant love, nothing. I love your... Italian American accent that it's came a giant out. Giant nothing. Forget about it. Forget about it. In all of your searching, in all of your mm -hmm. walks and nights mm -hmm. under the stars and opening up the hearts and laying the papers on the hearts, waiting for them to break and for the knowledge to seep you in. I really did read the book. I didn't read it. I took it in. Mm -hmm. I really took it in. I let the book on my heart and I opened my heart and let it, the words seep in. It was a real treat to have somebody you're friends with for a couple of decades write a book. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a unique. Thing that you don't always get to experience. Like how many of our friends have written books? Not many. Have you come to any conception of what this life at its essence is about? Mm. Is it a giant nothing? 
No. Does it matter what it is? Oh, yeah. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. It's about kindness. Huh. You know, about a year ago, I did a conversation with Parker, um, Parker Palmer, uh, in support of his book, On the Brink of Everything. Hmm. And he wrote it when he was 78, 79. He's now 80. And it's a brilliant collection of essays. And in that conversation, we talked about this sort of question that people carry, which is, have I lived a life of meaning? Mm. And we changed the question to, how have I been kind? Mm. I think it's about kindness. And the I think, interactions, the moment to moment. I think it's all about kindness. Mm. I think that, you know, um, when we have the bravery to sit still and look at our own structures, when we have the bravery to really ask ourselves these deep and meaningful questions, then we release ourselves from the need to not be kind. And then we get to be kind. And I will tell you, there are times in my life when I still struggle to be kind. No question about it. I got my own swords. Yeah. When you got two founders yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs. And oh, you're just that's like, easy. When I just yell at them and say, I'm going to stop this car and turn it around if you don't stop fighting. <laughs> Dad's I've taking been the there. car home. <laughs> I've been there. I only had to break up two fist fights between co-founders. Only two. Literally. <laughs> Literally. Physical altercations. But you know, Co-founder dynamics are bonkers. But at the end of that engagement, when both of those co-founders ended up being replaced by more professional managers, mm. they both hugged me and thanked me for being kind. Mm. And that didn't mean I was pleasant all the time. Right. It meant that I was kind. Mm. Um, life is not nothing. We make too big a deal out of the wrong things, but life is not nothing. There's something really beautiful when I look at you and I see you being the Jedi master to a young Padawan. Because you are benefiting from the teachers that I had. Yeah. If you don't, I'm going to come back down and I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> As only an older brother should. You got it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it's a, it is a nice thing, I think, when you collect people over a lifetime and I... Uh, I get the sense that we both have collected some very meaningful friends and I consider you one of the you know the 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 friends in my collection I'm, I'm most happy to have collected. I'll tell you of a moment. I I agree with you. Yeah. There was a moment where I was upstairs from the studio here and uh, I think Jackie went down and 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 I heard your voice say Jerry's here? Jerry's here? Yeah. And I heard the joy. Ah. And it made me happy. Yeah, well, you know, even when you were struggling through whatever demons you are, and I mm. was in my full samurai, maniacal, ronin period, uh, we had fun. We did. There was a sense of joy. There, there was a there sense was. of possibility. I remember you reaching out several times. I won't name their names because that would break some confidentiality, yeah. but I remember you reaching out really randomly out of the blue and saying, hey, can you help this person? Can you help that person? Yeah. And what, unbeknownst to you, what you were sending a message to me was, A, I know you're still there, Jerry. Yeah. B, I know that you're available. Yeah. And C, I care about these people. Yeah. And even if those people were exhibiting stupid ass behavior, yeah. you still cared about them. Yeah. And even at times when you do that Jason warrior thing, I see your heart, dude. If you work in Silicon Valley and you work in technology, you know it's not all about ping pong tables and free food and the hoodies. Those are all fun, sure. But there are a lot of challenges throughout the startup journey and no one understands them quite like our friends at Silicon Valley Bank, where I do my banking personally. Have a great idea for a startup, and I do it professionally actually as well. If you have a great idea for a startup and you don't know the right way to launch it, well, Silicon Valley Bank has helped thousands of startups and is always eager to share their insights. Feel like your company's growing at quantum speed? Well, Silicon Valley Bank strives to support you at your pace, quick, nimble, and always looking ahead. With Silicon Valley Bank, you're not just getting a bank. You're getting a banking and financial services partner, along with the insights and experience and scalable solutions that founders need to move their bold ideas forward faster. I know this because I work with Silicon Valley Bank and I have for over a decade. And when I email them, 
man, do I get a quick response. So here's your call to action. If you're a founder, a potential founder, or just someone with an idea and a whole lot of ambition, Silicon Valley Bank has solutions that will help support you from the seed stage to the big stage. So visit svb.com forward slash next to learn more. Silicon Valley Bank. Ideas. Bank here. I'll tell you the most meaningful moment. It just came up when you brought that up. Because I look back at that samurai period and it's kind of like uh, one giant fight scene in a movie, you know, it kind of blurs and you're, it's kind of hard to follow because yep. it's just like one of the, the my top three films is Gladiator hmm. and the mission as well. But mm -hmm. and you Black don't like Hawk Down. Nah, not for me. I'm not. I just. I mean, I like it, but I just don't like that actor Mel Gibson all that much. Yeah, uh, I, and it, I get it. But anyway, I just Gladiator was the one that uh, I always loved. You know what we do in this life echoes in eternity. Yeah, like really interesting uh, stuff. Um, but I just realized the most meaningful moment in all of that Silicon Alley reporter fame and fortune mm. uh, and that sort of moment of that I think made me Jason Calacanis and like all those. Uh, check boxes I got, right? Like, oh, I'm on the cover of the New York Times. Oh, I was on Charlie Rose. Oh, I made a million dollars. You know, all those check boxes that I, the lemon drops that I wanted to accumulate was a writer walked in one day and he said, let's call him Joe. He walked in, said, I'm not feeling so good, boss. And I looked up, kind of like half looked up. And I said, well, go home if you're sick or whatever. He goes, no, I... I feel like I might want to kill myself. Aww. And I said, oh, I didn't know what to do. And I said, uh, have a seat. Have you ever seen all the president's men? And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, you're a reporter and you haven't seen all the president's men? Mm -hmm. It's my favorite film. And I had a VHS in my room with all the president's men. For the youngins, that was and I would let them watch cassette. it. It was on video cassette, and I had it there because sometimes I would play it for people to just play different scenes that I thought were sort of. I said, "Watch this for one second. I'll be right back." And I went out and I called my mom from the stairwell. Mm. I said, "Mom, because she's a nurse, what do I do?" Mm. She goes, "Get in a cab, take them down to St. Vincent's, mm. uh, and uh, don't let them out of your sight." She, I, and as a boss, she goes, "Where is he?" And I said, "He's in my office." She goes, what floor are you on? And mm -hmm. is there a window? I said, you're on the 11th floor mm -hmm. and there's a window. She goes, go back to your office immediately. Do not let him out of your sight. Suicide people do really stupid things and mm -hmm. rash things. Take him to the hospital. And I took him to the hospital. And his parents, he said, just call my parents. Let them know I'm okay. So I call his parents who didn't live in New York. And I said, uh, your son, I don't mean to alarm you. He's safe. Mm -hmm. But your son is, uh, he's not feeling so good. And he's in the hospital mm. and he uh, is suffering from a lot of anxiety and he, he's kind of suicidal and they're going to keep him here for 30 days. Mm. And he, he said he wanted you to know because he, he wants to see you and his brothers. And they said, it's not possible. It's too far of a trip. I said, well, I'll pay for the tickets. Mm. And they said, yeah, it's just too inconvenient to go right now, but uh, which hospital is he in? And we'll, we'll take care of it later. I have the phone. It's just heartbreaking for me. Mm. The parents did not make the trip. Mm. It was too inconvenient. It's hard to hear that story from the vantage point of a child. It's, it's especially hard for me to hear that story from the vantage point of a parent. Because the truth is that... Um, uh, speaking just for myself, which is all I can speak for, um, uh, nothing would have prevented me. And, you would walk. And, you know, I look at you and I watch you with your children on Instagram. <laughs> the Insta. And, yeah, and I know. Yeah. I, I, I kind of think that how you are with your kids, like mm -hmm. going back to kindness, and I was having this discussion with a friend of ours, a mutual friend, and I was like, how you behave in the moments you have with them is, I think, the definition of who you are. Yeah, that's it. Like, are you on your phone checking your Slack messages? Mm -hmm. Or are you eating the ice cream? Mm -hmm. 
and looking them in the eyes and just talk about strawberry and, ice cream. And give them love, safety, and belonging. Yeah. 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 You know, the book is dedicated to my three children. And Did they read it? Oh, yeah. I have to ask, like, what? how old are your kids and what was the reaction? Did well, they know you had tried to kill yourself? Was this new information? Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing in the book that they- Oh, they, okay. There's details that they- weren't fully aware of it. The of time. their grandparents and great grandparents. Yeah. And they were passed. You know, um, so my children, Sam is 28. Oh, wow. Emma's 26. Wow. Michael's 21. That's mind blowing, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll show you pictures afterwards because Sam just had just won um, his second Muay Thai fight in the last six months. So wow. He's, uh, he's a warrior. He's a warrior. <laughs> Mao Tai is no joke. They're all warriors. Mao um, Tai is. But but sad. when you said, I think you used the phrase fucking awesome. Yeah. So that was the phrase that Michael said. Ah. And uh, what Emma said when having read the book was that it gave her insights into herself and into me. Yeah. And uh, one of the sweetest things that they all said was... Um, after I gave him the book, we were debating who was going to, were we going to hire somebody to read the book or something? And they looked at me, he's like, Dad, are you fucking kidding me? You have to read the book. I, I, I've i done the Did Hollis anyway. tried to start you? Stop you? No, 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 no. She no. tried to stop a me. Every, 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 and I told her, you yeah. have to understand, people don't want to listen to these they, yeah. voiceover actors, no offense. You want to yeah. listen to the author, yeah. especially if you're a podcaster, which you are. Yeah. People want to hear. I was so disappointed when I read Michael Ovitz's book, Who is Michael Ovitz, which is tremendous, by the way, as you read it. You want to talk about a maniacal samurai. <laughs> I mean, he really accumulated power and, and suffered the, the, and got the spoils and suffered the consequences of right. doing so. Right. And enemies accumulate. Mm. That's the friends you forget, but enemies, they, they stack up and accumulate. Mm hmm. Uh, anyway, they, my kids were so adamant that you that I read the book. Of course, it's your and legacy. of course I did, and uh, it, it was very moving to 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 feel like they see the three dimensionality of me. You know, in the in the book, I talk in the very last chapter. I talk about envisioning myself as a tree that this tree that I've encountered stretched by acts of kindness and and even um, the less than ideal parts of myself, all being born by the body. Um, I think, while I don't tell the whole story, because it's again, it's not a memoir, mm. I think I've told a true story. Yeah, you tell enough of your memoir right. to give people the permission, I think, to examine their own. And that was the point. You know, it's not narcissistic or self-indulgent. In fact, the book leaves you wanting to know more about your story. Well, that's book two. Yeah. Hopefully you <laughs> write another one. It is exhausting. There was a point in the book where you went to the movies with your son and he said the yeah. the movie, you thought the movie was about him and you were weeping. You couldn't get out of your sheet, but you never say what the movie was. And I still won't. <laughs> what? That was brutal. I guess it was Thor. <laughs> Thor Rangok <laughs> uh, versus Hulk. <laughs> you were crying about the Hulk. <laughs> All right, listen. We made it to ninety minutes. We didn't cry. Yeah. There might have been some I moments. No, Jackie. I think he was crying. He was I, I think he, it was my makeup. This, this I'm checking my makeup. About his makeup. My makeup is making me blink. It's mm -hmm. nothing. Like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I I cry at random things. Random moments make it me cry. It feels random to you, but yeah. the, the, the truth of the matter is it's not random yeah. at all. Movies get me sometimes. Songs get me these days. Like I listen to a song. It's you so know what poetic. will drop me to my knees? Certain smells. The lemon drops, the coffee grinds, and the figs. Cut trees. Cut trees. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Your health is okay? What's going on with I'm the good. stent? Uh, well, you didn't get the, the stent? I didn't get the stent, and Knockwood, my heart is really, my heart is well. The doctor said if it was up to him, he would have got the stent. And the best cardiologist in the state of Colorado said, you're fine. Get out of here. Really? Yeah. You look good. You dropped 75 pounds. When okay. I knew you, you were a little chubby. I was a little chubby. 75 pounds yeah. over. It's, uh, a lot of chicken parm going on yeah, there. A lot of gnocchis. Yeah, yeah. A, lot, a lot of ice cream. Is that it? Is that yours? <laughs> That's mine too. Oh, God, I love that ice cream. How did you lose it all? 
You just stopped. Oh, eating? it's been a long time. I think you I look great. Fifty. Thank you. I feel great. Fifty-five now. What are you? Fifty-five. Wow. How does it feel when you cross fifty? How did it feel for you? I'm forty-eight. I'm going to experience it, this. It in two years. feels great. It does. I am uh, happier than I have ever been. What do you think about death? Because we're counting in the book. You talk a little bit about like the. The goalposts you set, your dad, when he had his kids, when your dad passed, when your kids grow up, that yada, yeah. yada. We're, you start to count down, right, at 50. How, Do, you got I some expectation like, for I, yourself I or like, you put it out of your mind? Well, there are people in my life uh, who have modeled for me what it means to age mm -hmm. well and gracefully and to move into the next phases. And I feel like I'm paying it forward. When you know Parker turned 80 in February, um, Parker, man, I love you, dude. Um, he's my younger brother, as he says. Yeah. Um, and he has shown me what it means to age with fierce grace. Yeah. And that's my intention. Uh, by the way, I'm not done yet. I mean, no, I mean, I, you got 25 I, minimum great years in you, I think. Um, I, yeah. I You're going to make it to 80. Uh, You'll be skiing in your my, 70s. My commitment to my partners at Reboot is to hold the seat as CEO until I turn 60, which is five more years, at which time I want to hopefully the, 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 the work that we have unleashed will continue to grow. And then I'll be able to move into a place. You know, hopefully in the next 20 years, I'll do another three, maybe four books. Wow. Um, and then I'll be teaching and uh, I'll be the guy who's sitting on that board of directors saying things like, well, in my day, <laughs> you know, this is <laughs> what we Have you considered do. looking at it from yeah. this perspective? Yeah. We had a company, I, Cosmo. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I've served on over 120 boards of directors at this point. Um, Write a I've book about that. I've seen a lot. Oh yeah, my Lord, that's no. It's a great book, and and so I could I could sort of see the next twenty thirty years being in that space of uh, of of going gentle into that good night. Yeah, um, I ain't coming close. I I'm super healthy. Yeah, um, I intend Knock to live wood. a long, long time, um, but I intend to live with consciousness. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, when we were in our 20s and 30s, we were just adrenaline. We were just racing. We were just striving. Just striving. And, you know, striving, striving, striving. I think that's like kind of the generational thing. When you look back on our parents, it's, I think it's very easy for us to forgive them for the things that were imperfect mm -hmm. because we strove for 20 years and then maybe got all the lemon drops and had this ability to narcissistically consider everything that occurred, et cetera. Mm. They, had, they had seven kids, no money, carrying blocks of ice on their shoulder and in the summer and coal in the winter, like smoking Winstons and just trying to stay above water and keep seven kids fed. That It was all forward motion. There was no time to consider. That's right. And now you look at this next generation, our kids, whatever. Well, they have, you don't have to worry about food on the table. They don't have to worry about a job, this gig right. economy. What are they worried about? Income inequality, that they're not as rich as the next person. They're not a billionaire. They're not fronting on Instagram. They, they got a whole set of diseases mm -hmm. about FOMO, mm -hmm. fear of missing out. Our parents had a fear of starving. That's right. And their parents had a fear of being murdered right. in genocides. That's right. I don't know what our fear is. Our fear is our own narcissistic fulfillment, maybe, or understanding ourselves. And this next generation is taking photos of themselves on mock private jets. You heard about this? <laughs> they have a they have a studio set of a private jet, <laughs> so people can go take pictures of themselves for their feeds, pretending to be on a private jet. Newsflash: I've been on one. It's the same as any other plane. Yeah. It takes off. It lands. You get to the same place. The only thing that's different is you don't have to go through a security line. Right. It's literally the only thing that's different. Right. You're not missing anything. Well, and you can check your email on the plane a little bit more easily than on the Wi-Fi on United or something. You're sharing the Wi-Fi. Boo-hoo. <laughs> Boo-hoo, Jerry. I tried to explain this to somebody like, you're, if, you, if you have freedom in your schedule mm. and you could go live in Kyoto for three months, mm. you won. Mm. 
I can't go to Kyoto for three months. Mm -hmm. I got three kids. Mm -hmm. I got 50 employees. I got mm -hmm. 250 portfolio companies. I got speaking gigs. I got podcasts. I got a lot of responsibility. Easy. Easy there. Easy for me. No, no, no. Easy to breathe. Just, just be gentle on yourself right now. I can't I help go to but Kyoto. Coach you. I want to go to Kyoto for three months. I'm just. So here's the question for you. Yeah. How might I go to Kyoto? How might I go to Kyoto? And what would be the benefit to all of those people to whom I feel so utterly responsible if they did not get emails from me for th for three months? Jackie's laughing because she's like, oh my God, I would be able to rest. <laughs> they don't want me to go to Kyoto. Huh? I don't think they want me in Kyoto. Part of that 360 that we're going to do. Trust me, J Jake House in Kyoto, <laughs> the register stops ringing. <laughs> Everybody needs to get their lemon drops here. I'm the, I'm the lemon drop machine at this point. All right, listen. Kyoto twist. Thank you, Jackie. Jackie just wrote, inside Kyoto. I don't know why I want to go to Kyoto so bad. I just feel like I went to Japan and I was just like enthralled with it again. I've never been to either T Tokyo or Kyoto. What? Kyoto would be someplace that I would want to let's go. go. To. You want to go to Kyoto? Yeah, let's go. Let's go to Kyoto. Take me to Kyoto. I'm taking you to Kyoto. You take That's me it. to Kyoto. I would love to go to Kyoto with and you. And we'll watch Kurosawa in Kyoto. Oh, yeah. We can watch uh, Yojimbo on, on my uh, private jet on the way there. You got it. Well, actually, let's make one of your rich friends pay for us. Let's make Fred <laughs> Wilson do that. <laughs> yeah, Fred Wilson did okay. <laughs> You have any regrets about not going into the second fund that's and doing a, that? That's the next episode. <laughs> the next episode. All right. I'm going to let you go. We only did this time 100 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I get you here. I feel like our time together on this podcast mm. is so special for us. Mm. Thank you. Because I know we both enjoy our time together. But I think we also realized that- I've been that looking forward to this for weeks. Me too. When you sent me the note, you know what the crazy thing is? I got the book mm. and I said, I'm going to read it the four days, mm. so whatever, 250 pages. Let's, I'll knock it out in four days. I don't want to read it until right before you right. come on the pod because I want to so be fresh. So it's fresh. Yeah. 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 So I'm reading it every day. There's a piece of paper in the note. Mm. I didn't read that you sent me a personal note until the last minute this morning. Oh. And I read the note about the first time we met. I thought that was incredibly sweet of you to do. Oh, listen, uh, uh, you mean a lot to me. It, it, the feeling. And when I right. wrote to you and I said, it, you know, I was anxious about your reaction, it's because of the tenderness of my being open. And yeah. the truth is, um, what the people in my life that I care about, what they feel about the book means a lot to me. I think it's important. Like the writing of a book, I think especially at the period in our lives we're at, there's enough there. That's right. There's enough there for you to say something that's worth reading. That's right. And my agent, John Brockman, who's just been tremendous to me for 10 years before I wrote the book, he was my agent for nine years. And mm -hmm. then I wrote the book in the 10th year. And I just said no to the blogging for dummies, angel investing for dummies. I said, I want to, you know, like all these other things. I just, I'm not feeling it yet. And yeah. then, you know, you, you get to a certain point where you're like, okay, it's time. I have something that's worth saying. Yeah, worth reading. That's something that's worth reading. Well yeah. said. Yeah. Like you think about all these people are writing books mm. with the goal of being an influencer. Yeah. Their goal is to have this external- It's not to write the book. It's not to write the book. Right. And you can tell when you wrote the book, you had to get this on paper. Yeah. Because you had a sense of giri. Yeah. Which is the Japanese word for a deep seated mm. um, duty. Mm. Like it's a deep seated uh, mitzvah that you have to do. It's your That's giri, right. G I R I. And it comes across in the book. And I just want to tell everybody who's listening whether you're a founder, a fan of tech, a venture capitalist, or just a human. And I, and I think human is probably the, the audience that should read this book. Yeah, I think humans. I think this book. Is literally for humans. Yeah. So if you hear my voice right now and you're a human, I want you to just stop what you're doing. Take out your phone, put your car in self-driving, and go on Amazon and or Barnes and Noble or whatever bookseller you love. And I want you to order Reboot by Jerry Colonna. Leadership and the Art of Growing Up. With a foreword by Sharon Salzberg. The book is tremendous. Thank you. Even if we weren't close friends, 
I'd have the same opinion. You knocked it out of the park. Thank you. It is a tour de force. Um, and I think it's a book that people will read, put down, and three or four or five years later, read it again and get a whole different set of insights. Uh, you were very anxious about the book. Mm -hmm. You said that many times in the book. You didn't know if you were doing a good job. That's right. But you read Bird by Bird, like I did when I was writing my book. <laughs> That's right. And Lamont. <laughs> has I Because when you get your big advance, you go onto Amazon and you say <laughs> books on writing. And then you find this book, Bird by Bird, which is the number one book by Anne right. Lamont, right. who talks about how to get through it. Right. You got through it, Jerry. Yeah. You got through it. Got past the shitty first draft. You got past the shitty first draft. And you know, you think maybe, oh, it's not like it's a perfect book. Oh, it it rambles. Oh, it's a series of essays. Oh, it doesn't have like some specific arc or thing. It's perfect. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. grabs you by the heart in the beginning mm -hmm. and then it holds you to the end and it opens up just the philosophical and deep questions that mm -hmm. if you started with those, mm -hmm. a person wouldn't be able to, to get there. Mm -hmm. But as you masterfully open up yourself in the book, it gives permission to the reader to open up themselves and do some introspection. The number one thing for founders to know about being successful, and they ask me this a lot, and I always tell them self-awareness. Yeah, Resilience is up there too, but it's very rare to find somebody resilient who is not also self-aware. That's right. You need to be self-aware. You need to look inward to be a great leader. And this is the book, Reboot. I don't know if this is the final cover, the CEO is Sir, Gimlet Media, <laughs> bought by Spotify. All right, Jerry, it's been great. I hope these, uh, you've been on the podcast twice or three times? This is my third time. Third time, wow. The book is out June, May? June 18th. June 18th. I want you to pre-order. It's very important that you don't wait. You have to pre-order because you know what happens with those pre-orders? I know, They I know. count towards week one. <laughs> That's All right, right Jerry Colonna, thank you. Uh, thank reboot. You. .io if you want to go to one of the conferences or get a coach. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.